rest in his love I will trust the Lord Oh my soul So this morning is a little bit of a spiritual smorgasbord Borg, board, Borg. Is it a board or a Borg? A D, C. Yeah, board, like a charcuterie board, in the spirit. Right. Yeah, that's what we're going for. A feast, nevertheless. As we were coming out of this three weeks here of fasting and feasting, we did sense some things to help kind of wrap up and clarify, conclude, nuance, and and really action steps moving forward. So if you participated in the fast and feast, uh, you'll track right along. And even if you didn't, there's, I believe, as God's word always has, a great feast for those who want to hear. A question to begin. We really have the privilege to ask ourselves regularly, to ask not ourselves, but the Holy Spirit. As a follower of Jesus, you can ask this at any moment of any day, but coming out of a season of fasting, feasting, where you've said no to some things in particular by choice, to say yes and adding other things into your life by choice, all in order to just seek after the communion of the Holy Spirit, to seek after the tangible presence of God, to let the Holy Spirit reveal and speak as we begin the year. A fabulous question to ask the Holy Spirit is, is there a new normal? Is the Holy Spirit speaking and leading you to make part of the fast and or feast new normal for life? There's a great scripture in Isaiah 43 that speaks to this new normal that God loves to do. It's not in the context of fasting in this passage, which is cool because it can be or it doesn't have to be is the point. God shares his heart and it's very, very confirmed that this is a gospel invitation from the Old Testament that is the gospel in the New Testament and we'll get there in a minute all the way through Revelations when Jesus says, behold, I am making all things new. Isaiah 43, 19 In the ESV translation, God says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? That's an interesting question. That's the spiritual reality that God could be at work and we're missing it. God goes on to say, I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. A different translation, I believe this is the message translation, says this. God says, be alert, be present. Those are good words. Alert and present to God. Alert and present to the little subtle nuances, the whispers of what the Spirit might be up to as a good work in you. Be alert, be present. I'm about to do something brand new. It's bursting out. Don't you see it? It's a parallel with where Jesus prays that we would have eyes to see and ears to hear what God is up to. God says then, there it is. I'm making a road through the desert Rivers in the Badlands. It's an utterly profound question. Are you listening? Are you alert? Are you sober to the nuances, to the work, to the moving of the Spirit, to the speaking of His voice, to His children He knows by name? He calls out and leads them to see the new things that God is saying and doing. And so to make it really practical from the fast and feast, you may have fasted from something that now as you listen to the Spirit and you see the good fruit in your life as you've said no to some certain things or curbed some normal impulses 
And again, they might, they're not even necessarily sinful things. When you fast, like you're not, I mean, if you've got to cut out sin, that's a good thing, but that's not, a, that's not really a fast. That's not like, okay, now, now I'm going to go back to it afterwards. It's like, no, you, you, there, there's, there's, that's kind of just the basic obedience of following Jesus. That's a good thing. That, but hey, if that's a new normal in an area, that's awesome. But even in the fast itself, it's not necessarily a, a bad thing you're cutting out. However, there may be a nuance that the Lord's saying, I, I, like a Navy SEAL, I want to take you to that, that next level of communing in my pres- presence to where, you know what? I'm saying, hey, you don't, even never, you don't even need to ever go back to that. I got something even better. You could go back to that, but I've got something even better. Or along with that, is there something that you were feasting on, an intentional way, a method in which you were feasting on the Lord in greater measure that now just becomes part of your new normal, where you say, you know what, I I never want to go without that again. Or I want that to become part of my spiritual discipline repertoire because you know what? I tasted and saw that the Lord was good and I, I want to keep that going. So there's a mindset of like, we don't want to just say, hey, you know what? We fasted and feasted and now let's just, we, oh man, we survived. Now chuck all that out and just binge on whatever. There, there's a, I believe, a, a beautiful opportunity for a new normal of what God might want to be doing that oftentimes can feel very subtle, but can be so powerful. To me, it's kind of that like Navy SEAL level up. So just one specific example, because over the years, as we've been intentionally fasting here as a church family for over 10 years and doing it ourselves for longer than that, there's these, these whispers that the Holy Spirit shows you probably even in the middle of the fast, where you have this sense of like, oh man, this is really fruitful to cut this out. I, I, I want to keep that going. Or man, this is really fruitful to add that in. I want to keep that going. So for me in particular, one is the very intentional practice of gratitude. To where over the years in the fast, that's come up a number of times, fast and feast, that was part of my feasting. There's even one year when it was you know 30 days straight of spending time before bed and writing down everything I was grateful for in that day. Like if I believe God's word, which says it all over, but James 1 is a great one that says every single good thing you have in life is a gift from God. You didn't earn it. It's all grace. Even when you do make an effort and partner with God, it's still all under the umbrella of grace. So there's an incredibly powerful reflection tool of looking back at a single day, let alone a week, a month, a year, and just saying, what are the good things going in my life? How can I practice this gratitude? And and I remember that being so transformative in my life as I did it for several years that it is now absolutely one of my favorite spiritual disciplines that feels like a conduit to plug right into God's presence. It's like the, the, you know, the super mega fast gigabyte ethernet cord. If I'm ever, you know, when I'm feeling like, where is God at? Where is God at? I'm kind of stressed, having a rough day. Gratitude right now. Plug in. Ah, there you are, God. And it's supernaturally powerful at this point. And, and right along with that is there's a, a piece of, feast, of fasting for me, which is where to train the brain, retrain the brain, untrain the brain, that when I have a moment of downtime, I don't just go pick up a screen of some sort. Because my mind was trained to do that. I mean, I could even feel it at the stoplight in the car. It's like, oh, I'm busy, busy, driving, driving. Um, I got 40 seconds of, of quiet. I'm anxious. I'm serious. Test yourself. I, this is for me. I'm anxious. Well, I need to do something right now. Oh, I'll, I'll check. Do I have any texts? And that's right where the Lord is saying, you know, through fast, like, you know, kind of weaned off of that. And I use that word weaned like an addiction because it was for me. My, 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 my mind and spirit was restless if there was downtime to where combine that with the gratitude and, and it's like, no. 
take this moment of downtime and just take a deep breath, check in with God, practice a little gratitude. And now that over 5, 10, 15 years of, of fasting has absolutely become one of the most precious, sacred, intimate, special, normal ways of everyday life, I will never go back. It's like saying like developing over 15 years practices of healthy intimacy and there's like no way do I ever want to go back to the way that we used to try to solve arguments when we were 21. That would be a catastrophe. So it's the same mindset of like what new thing or new normal is the spirit beckoning you, saying, hey, wasn't this good? Didn't it feel good to not need that? Didn't it feel great to connect with me through that? Hey, make that a little bit more of your new normal. So between you and the spirit, we strongly encourage this week to maybe be a, a question, a reflection in your life groups, even just on your own, it's right there in the lift notes, to be really asking God, is there kind of this level up of relationship where the Lord's inviting you, hey, make this part of your new normal because you want to, not out of a legalistic, I have to, but out of your joy in communion with him, you want that to be part of just the new normal that never goes away. We have talked about screens a bit, and I just want to touch on it for a moment, that our litmus test should be the quiet God created us so that we would be and live in communion with him, that we would check in with him, that his spirit is the one that leads us, not the pings, not the texts, and we literally get robbed of the life that God has for us when we pick up the screen you, don't, you didn't really pick it up at the stoplight, did you? Yes. <clears throat> okay. Anyways. Um. <laughs> Sorry. Confession of secrets, my secret life. <laughs> hey, it, and you know what? It's a process and something that we need to be aware of because I'm shocked that he did that because we've been fighting this for a long time and aware of this for many years. So well, I didn't say it was this fast. Oh, you gotta listen a little I'm like, dude, I seriously, in, in. stop light. Like, recently, <laughs> we've been fast. going after this hard for like five years. Yes, I, was anyway, giving examples, I love him. <laughs> a conglomeration of past fast together. Anyways, but what we need to, I feel like our hearts to, to regularly be aware of so that we can just be managing where our souls are at is where are we checking in? Yes. Because the screens, you know, he was talking about a documentary before. Their goal is to keep us on them all day long. You know, I mean, so it's not just for, for physical health reasons that the 4G, 5G is awful for your health. Go ahead, Google it. But it's our spiritual health. It's, we're not meant to be connected to entertainment things selling stuff to us, constantly connected to um, hundreds of other people. We're meant to be in communion with the one. Amen. Otherwise, we're constantly plugging into empty cisterns and wondering why we're scattered, empty, broken, a mess, and never filled up, and why our brains can't even focus on his presence because actually being overstimulated by the screens because they are overstimulating, um, the level of contrast and brightness and fast motion just doesn't exist in nature. 
And what it does is it creates an anxiety when you get off of it. It creates a, almost in a sense like an ADD where your brain is being formed over constant, formed around constant stimulation. And then when you get off, it's, I need to get stimulated. And you see that, unfortunately, in the kids that are on screens all the time, video games, phones, and they can't focus. And it's honestly not their fault because they've just been handed the screens. But we need to treasure, we need to treasure, like Mary treasured and pondered the words that God gave her. We need to treasure and ponder those moments of intimacy and all the pauses that we are given because every pause is a gift to commune with the one who makes us complete. I love that word pause. <clears throat> it's in the Bible in many places, Selah, throughout the Psalms. The writer will speak an amazing truth and then will say, Selah. It means breath, it means pause, reflect, ponder. And you can see in the Psalms, the, the breath, the pause, the ponder is meant to create a rhythm of communion and connection with God. Like there's a great truth that is proposed, that is put forward, and then, in a sense, our job is to not just go on to the next great truth so we fill our head with more information. It's take that great truth and breathe, pause, ponder, commune with God through that great truth. And so I love that word selah because it's so challenging to our culture. What I was describing at the stoplight is a selah. From the busyness of my day, I have a moment of selah where I'm to breathe in and ponder and commune with God around gratitude. But to her point, which is so key and so hard in our world, we're being trained to take any moment of pause and plug in to a different source. It's not God. And it's not God. That's where God says, I'm a jealous God. So are we plugging into the sources that aren't him? And again, and it's not in, in and of themselves, that source in the moment is a sin and a bad thing. You can play a video game once in a while. You can check Instagram once in a while. You can go on Facebook once in a while. That in itself is not necessarily inherently bad. But if it becomes a replacement for communion in Selah, with the one who is supposed to be the, the meditation of our day and night, the praise of our day and night, the gratitude of our day and night, where Paul says, pray without ceasing. He's talking about a relationship in God's presence that's never supposed to end, and it increases through our intentionality in the moments of Selah. And so that's, that's what we're going after. Is We, we, we don't want to just take on and be conformed to this world. Yeah. We want to be transformed by the renewing of our mind because God has different ways than what is just going to be taught to us by the world. And so this Selah moment of looking for those pauses and are we going to communion with God as our river of delights, as the feast in the abundance of his house. And I believe for each and every one of us, there's going to be a personal journey that he wants to take us on, where, at least I know for me, there's incremental steps. So it's a little bit less of that, a little bit less of that. Just be careful that it's not just this legalistic, because then oh, that gets tough. Where it's not bad to cut something off. It's good to cut stuff off, want. but it's a journey and a dance, and that's, we'll leave it at that. Yeah, I'll Point number one. One more thing. I love what he said about the um, Romans 12, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And ultimately what it comes down to in everything is returning to divine design. You know, when it comes to 
even the foods that we eat created by factories that God didn't make and their effects on our body to the screens that are being pushed. There's an agenda of money everywhere. And this has become our new, the new normal where it's like, wait, what? You're not supposed to um, be on your screen all day long? That's bizarre. It's become like this, you know, I don't know if anybody's seen the Matrix movie, but it's like this fake reality that's been created and it's been accepted as normal. And we just, we got to get out of this game and realize this is not divine design. It's actually toxic soup for the soul. So I would, I would just encourage us with that, almost that phraseology yeah. <laughs> of not being conformed to this world and, and an awareness of asking the Holy Spirit in this digital age where there's, you know, love of money and that's pushing the agenda from the FDA food guidelines to also the stats on video games and what they do to children's brains to the toxic horrible effects of vaccines and the gov of the covid vaccine and the government suppressing all of that it's all about money i'm sorry but you know it is what it is it's the truth um but we need to be divine design a return to divine design where we are desiring and asking the Lord for revelation to reveal to us his ways that we wouldn't be conformed to this world, but we would be transformed to his ways so that we can experience true riches, true satisfaction, true pleasure, true fruit of the spirit, true power. Amen. That's it. That's it. All right, moving on the same ideas, but just wanting to further clarify and nuance. The second bullet point there in the lift notes is just the great and encouraging truth that new normals that we're talking about here, where God speaks and we get transformed, those kind of new normals, they're not just for the new year. They're not just for seasons of fasting. They are a normal way of life for followers of Jesus. New normals are normal for followers of Jesus. They are wrapped up in the very invitation to the gospel, to the good news. New normals all the time in the gospel invitation. Let's go to Mark 1, 15 and 14. The most succinct place of the presentation of the gospel, the good news, in the Bible, on the lips of Jesus. It says, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God. Gospel is the same exact word as good news, euangelion, good news. So Jesus is proclaiming God's good news, saying the time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. So repent and believe in the good news. This is one of our core scriptures in this Church, this is one of the core scriptures of followers of Jesus. We gotta know the gospel. It's one of our core discipleship tools. The basic nutshell idea is that Jesus is saying the good news, God's good news, it's his idea, not yours, not mine. We didn't make it happen. We can't make it happen. This is all God. God's good news is that he is giving us a divine opportunity to transform our current reality with more of heaven. That's the gospel. That's a paraphrase of these words, unpacked. Each word is so rich, like that word kairos for time means divine opportunity. It's not chronological time. It's saying God has ordained this time. It's God's work. It's God's doing. It's God's grace. God has made a divine opportunity for you right now for the kingdom of God to reign in greater measure in your life. So more of heaven to transform your current reality. So the good news, in a nutshell, is that there is a divine opportunity for a new normal. Heaven is on the move to transform your life in any tiny and every massive way. You wake up every morning, there's an opportunity for a new normal where more of heaven is longing, desiring, knocking to break through and see a new normal, see a transformation, see your life get healed, forgiven, transformed, strengthened, renewed, all these words in the Bible. That's what it's about. It's this 
incremental process of growth and transformation from one degree of glory to another to become like Christ as we behold him. That's 2 Corinthians 3, 16 to 18, another absolutely foundational reality. So until the day we die or Christ calls us home, the good news of new normal knocks on our door every time we wake up. And God's saying, I'm not done with you yet. Are you going to have a disciple's mindset? Disciple just means learner. Till the day I die, am I going to have a learner's mindset that says, God has more for me? <laughs> what is the more? More of heaven, a new normal, a renewing of my mind after how God thinks and how God does things and what's actually possible with God's presence. What's impossible with man is possible with God. Is that permeated? Has that permeated every single aspect of your being, every fiber of your mind, every aspect of your body, mind, and spirit? No, it hasn't, just so you know. I was helping you answer. So there's more. That's good. New normals are coming. So it's, it's, it's incredibly exciting that even in the fast, like what it can do is it, it can help us be aware heightenedly aware to all the new normals that could be that sometimes we kind of get in a, a malaise about because we've just kind of gotten into that consumer culture that, that is the air we breathe. And so that's why Jesus said, when you fast, not if, but when, because fasting is good for the soul. It's good to feel that like, oh, I'm hungry, I'm thirsty. Oh, man, I've been going to that. Oh, I've been going to that. I've been going to that during my selahs. Oh, and, and you get this heightened awareness, and God's like, I got new normals. What if that, that thing you go to could be more of me in increasing measure? And so in, in contrast, an honest question is, if we don't have new normals in our life, what's God doing? Do you not perceive it? That's that Isaiah 43 passage. Combine it with Revelation 3 where Jesus says to all the believers, I'm knocking on the door. Are you going to open it? That's new normals right there. That's why we love the question in this church. We loved it before this church even existed of what's God doing in your life? God wants every single genuine believer on the planet to have a very long, personal, intimate powerful answer to that question at any moment in your life. What is God doing in your life? If the answer is not much, it's not on God's end. If the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is knocking on the door, asking to come in for a meal every day of our life, because he is desiring for our testimony to keep getting bigger and bigger. And when someone says, what's your testimony? You don't have to go back five years or 10 or 20. Hopefully you got to go back five minutes or five days. This is what God's doing right now because he's knocking every day. New normals are what he brings to the party. That was the exact verse I was going to go into, and we hadn't talked about that. Rock and roll. Him knocking at the door. When he knocks at the door, and when we're looking to seek him instead of something else, it's never from a viewpoint of scolding. It's that he has something better. He has something so much better for him. So regular questions for us to keep in mind would be, where are we going for our satisfaction? Where do we go when we're stressed? He welcomes us to his banqueting table, and he's always at the door knocking to meet us in whatever we are settling for that's less than heavenly. I'll give a personal example for me. And it's so subtle that I don't even notice it. But it's just the thing, say, with a, a mother's heart or, um, you know, where sometimes you'll just have worry about your kids. And I don't go through it 
for a long time in my head. It's just a split second. Oh, KJ's neck is hurting. They went snowboarding the other day and KJ was in a lot of pain and I'm just like, you know, for the moment there's just this, oh, you know, I hate that he's in pain. And he's, he's had a neck injury in the past and it's healed so much. Um, but I felt like God reminded me of this fast that I did a few years ago and I just, I try to make it just a normal thing, but you know, you forget. You just, there's habits and you just forget. And I felt like he just said, I felt like the Holy Spirit last night spoke to me and said, I want this to be a fast for life for you. Um, negativity is another thing, any negative thought. But specifically, this was about, um, you know, worrying, you know, worrying about money, worrying about my kids, just the thoughts. And it's not a long thought. I don't go into long thoughts of, oh, I'm so worried about this. It's just this emotion for a moment. But I need to slay that and operate in the power of the kingdom. Not just, when, when I just kind of let it sit, it kind of sits heavy on me. It's just sitting there. I'm worried about it. And I felt like God reminded me of this fast where we were re I was really, really worried about um, a couple specific situation. One was finances. The other one was just a very difficult, volcanic <laughs> situation with uh, relationships of um, someone that, you know, isn't nearby, so don't worry. Um, but it was, it was like a friend thing. And um, it was a mess. And I just felt like God called me to, I couldn't separate from the worry. It was kind of like, uh, it was just kind of like looming over me until we had this conversation. And I felt like the instructions that he gave me were cut it off and worship. Anytime you feel that heaviness and you're, you're scared or you're worrying, cut it off and worship me. You've got this, God. And, and there are different things that I would do. Sometimes it was just straight worship as like just an absolute discipline. And I'm not even necessarily worshiping him for anything. I'm just worshiping him. I'm cutting it off, worshiping him, being his child and trusting that he's got this and that I can be free just to worship without the heaviness of that looming over me. And you know, there are other things like speaking to things and partnering with him, but I felt like he led me in this, um, you know, last night at the end of the fast, just to say, I want this to be a way of life. That as soon as the worry or any negative thought comes in about a human being or any situation, I want you to slay it, to take that thought captive. And the first thing I do is I worship, and then I ask him if he wants to lead me in more. And the scriptures are pretty clear on all these subjects that I would be thinking of on what he wants to lead me in the more about. So I just want to throw that out there. And also another thing along the lines of gratitude with what he was sharing is what I realized last night is the antidote for worry is testimony and praise. So you know, a garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And last night, as I was concerned about my son's, you know, really bad head pain, it was just a reminder to go back to, do you remember a year and a half ago, in my mind, his neck was so bad, he couldn't lift anything. We couldn't even touch his shoulder without causing searing nerve pain that would last him sometimes for days. It was that bad. Praise you, Jesus, you've taken him so far. Thank you, Jesus, that you are completing the good work that you started. Thank you, Jesus, for his complete healing right now by your stripes. We thank you for what you purchased on the cross. So, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Our last point that we're going to close with, the third bullet in the lift notes. As we've been talking a lot about discipline, self-control, you know, some, some ew words, you know, in the fast. But they've been transformed. They've actually, they can be transformed. They can be words that fill us with a sense of power, purpose, peace, excitement. 
Discipline and self-control, as we see described in the Bible, are a normal part of a powerful Christian life, not just reserved for a season of fasting. So during the fast, we looked at a lot of great verses and testimonies. Last week, we spent the whole week on 2 Peter and this charge, this challenge based on the good news that God has given us everything we need. What a promise. Everything we need for a life of godliness. And he went on to say, so we can make every effort to grow in as men and women of character, in virtue. And one of those things is self-control. And this whole thing, it's a, the whole thing is a disciplined life. There's intentionality Discipline is really simply just an intentional way of you know where you're focusing your time, your attention, and your energy in order to achieve goals that you have as valuable. And that becomes something that's like, how, how would you not want to live with that? And so there's just want to close with an encouragement around this idea of discipline and, and self-control they are seen as absolutely normal and vital to the Christian life. They are not just these little things that we take off during short or take on during short seasons of fasting and we just kind of grin and bear it and then, you know, we're, oh, we made it through that. Yes, now I get to live in freedom and just binge and cast off all restraint. That that will lead you down a road of destruction. You will not reach your kingdom goals without the proper restraint and discipline. Nobody does. Nobody achieves valuable goals without discipline. Nobody achieves valuable goals without discipline. It's because it's built into part of seeking him is he is the vision and so you focus in with intentionality and you cut out all other things that are going to distract you and keeping you from that goal and you get a laser sharp focus of communion with God, transformation of my character to aim higher in virtue. Those are the goals and so I'm going to cut out all the stuff that's going to be a hindrance to me and I'm going to focus time, attention, and energy toward the goal. Nobody achieves goals without that mindset. 1 Corinthians 9 is a phenomenal passage. Just want to go to one more time to encourage us. Make this a new normal for all of us. That discipline, self-control are awesome. <laughs> They're awesome. In, in, they are power. In such contrast to our culture which says, oh, discipline, that's so boring, it's so regulated, it's so rote and repulsive, it's bondage. No, no, those are lies. <laughs> like, those are lies to take you down a road of destruction. There are no good goals that are achieved in life without discipline, in, in whatever sphere. And that's why I love how Paul uses the athlete as the example. And so I know a lot of us in here can connect with athletes and sports, and it's one of the I would say very good examples in our culture of how when you have high goals, you must have disciplines to match those goals or you will not get there. And, and so Paul does that. He holds up the athlete as the example of discipline. Listen to 1 Corinthians 9, 26 in, in, in the NLT. I, oh my gosh, I want to tattoo this on my head. I live with purpose in every step. That is, is, is an incredible thought. I live with purpose in every step. I mean, meditate on that until you are a disciplined nerd aficionado. No, superhero, not nerd. You become a superhero. No, well, God's a superhero. No, 1 Corinthians 9.25 a little bit before that, in the NASB has, a, has the right idea. Do you not know that those who run in a race, they all run, but only one receives the prize? So run in such a way that you may win. 
So he takes the athlete example of competition and winning and he immediately flips it to the spiritual life and he says, so do the same thing with life. Run to win. That's holy, healthy competition. God wants you to win at life. Who do you win against? You. You win against the the flesh. You overcome the flesh. That's what we were looking at in 2 Peter last week. The whole thing is about overcoming the, the vices in us, the flesh in us, the weakness in us, and growing in virtue like Christ so that we win in life. And she joked just now about being a superhero. And it's like, well, actually, God's a superhero. Well, what we looked at last week is in Peter, it's a yes, both. When you make every effort, as Peter says to, to grow in these disciplines, it then says to keep you from being ineffective and unprofitable. And the real, the healthy translation is to put you in charge of being unhealthy, ineffective, and unprofitable in your life with God. So who's the superhero? It's the both and. It's the God's grace, the umbrella that covers it all. He's empowered you. He's given you everything you need. 2 Peter 3, 1, 3 says, he's given you everything you need by the spirit for a godly life. So now you can make every effort to grow in these things so that you can be in charge of your life not being given into and given over to these impulses that take you down the road of destruction. And so he, Paul uses this athlete example and he says, don't be a loser. Run to win. That's God's will for your life. Don't plan on losing at life. Plan to win. The win being you get transformed to be more like Christ and your communion with him grows in increasing measure. And with it goes the virtuous character of Christ. Plan to win at that. And our job, as Paul goes on to say, is be disciplined with it. Last point here, everyone who competes in the games, verse 25, exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable prize. We do it an imperishable. In other words, take that we And he's describing the life of an athlete, and now that's our spiritual life. In other words, we exercise self-control in everything. So those two phrases right there, oh my gosh. Those are superhero secrets right there. Verse 26, I live with purpose in every step. Verse 25, I exercise self-control in all things. I mean, those are things to take before the Lord to take this discipline as a new normal and say, God, show me how I can live with purpose in every step. Because none of us have got that perfect, right? So there's, it's the, this is the increasing measure. Show me, God, how I can choose to exercise self-control in all things. In all things. Every moment of every day to the glory of God, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do to the glory of God. Do it to the glory of God. Exercise self-control in all. The same word all right there, panta. So let me live with purpose in every step. There's the rest of our life right there on our part. Now it's God's grace making it all happen. But how can we line up with what he's doing? So in our part, we're living with purpose in every step. Discipline. It's a great thing. May it be a new normal that we flip the script again, not to be conformed to this world. It's like, oh, God wants to oppress you and hold you back. Lie. He wants to set you free from bondage and free into communion with him. And discipline is the path to get there. Discipline is cool in the kingdom. Yeah, I just think that's so good that discipline is a place of power. It's also a place of tasting and seeing that the Lord is good. That we're not doing all of this out of, oh, self-sacrifice. 
We're doing it because he's better, because he has something better. And in the process, the word of God is invaluable to get us there. So I, I want to encourage us to use the word of God as the sword of the spirit that it is. Just a testimony from my own life. Uh, one of the, we have kind of many fasts that we do regularly just as a way of life. Just God is working on this with me. God is working on this with me. God is working on this. God's working on me getting my bedtime earlier so that I can, you know, be filled with energy and live the abundant life that he wants and, you know, not get distracted by, oh, I need to get this done. I need to get this done. And then all of a sudden I've robbed my sleep. And um, I was so empowered by speaking that verse over myself, the purpose in every step, just I live with purpose in every step. So as I'm choosing not to get this done that I need to, and I'm choosing this fast that God has chosen for me, God actually spoke to me about the fast of working to get, to get in bed earlier, you know, saying this is the fast that I'm choosing for you. You can do whatever else you want. You know, and I chose a number of different things um, just because it's something that I really just I want more of God, you know. But the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. His word, when we use it, when we pick up that sword, cuts things out and infuses us with life. And so I want to encourage us that as we're on a journey and we're pursuing this discipline as a way of life, that we use the word of God because it is living and active and not just use the word of God when we're sitting down and having a quiet time, but all day long. And you know, what's amazing to me is that kind of a revelation that God highlighted to me was um, the life of Jesus. You know, Jesus says in John 5, that he only does what he sees the Father doing. He lived in such a close communion every moment that he knew exactly what the Father was doing, and he followed him. And that's just absolutely amazing to me. The, the th last thing, I felt like God specifically spoke these words that regarding his promises regarding the character growth that we want to see, regarding the promises of breakthrough for whatever situation we are facing, I felt like he spoke these words, treasure and ponder, like Mary did after she was told about what was going to happen with carrying the Messiah. She treasured and pondered these things in her heart. But then two more words, steward and partner, action steps, Treasure and ponder, steward and partner. And I felt like God brought to mind Joshua 1, and I felt like he was saying that with regard to the promises, all of the great promises that he has for us in his word, that we need to be regularly active, that we treasure and ponder, meditating on them, getting the word of God in us, going over the promises that he's given us, and that we also, and that, that that in itself is stewarding and partnering, but that we also take action steps to steward and partner. And I felt like he told me to read Joshua 1, and I felt like the Spirit was saying, and that exact thing is in there. And I'm like, hmm, I don't remember that. But okay, you know, I remember, be strong and courageous. But then I go and I read it, and it's actually super powerful. And so I want to Oh, yeah, I want to actually read two translations. I want, yeah, I know I'm finishing. I'm in trouble. I went too long. Um, I want to leave us with this just encouragement to treasure and ponder and steward and partner. Okay. The ESV. Okay, I'm going to read the ESV version. version. Be strong and courageous. For you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand 
or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. In it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. So we don't need another version. The NLT is a cool one. Um, it really emphasizes that in these two areas where it says that you may do not turn to the right or left, that you may have good success wherever you go, and then where it says, but you will meditate, meditate on the book of the law day and night so that... You, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written, for by then, for, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. That's a, um, what was that word that you used again? Condition. In the original Hebrew, I actually had him look it up to make sure. It's a conditional clause, meaning we need to treasure and ponder, steward and partner, get in the word of God, get in his promises, and active with an active pursuit so that we can make our way prosperous and have good success. Now, what's interesting is the power. We have the power to choose. It says, for then you will make your way prosperous. So the other end of this is, if you don't, you won't, you know? And, and we have this um, almost misnomer or misconception in Christianity where there's this um, unhealthy amount of sovereignty that is not biblical and takes away our choices that we give to God. Where it's like, well, I guess God didn't do it. Really? Did God not do it? Or did you not do your part? You know? Jesus was the perfect example of this. When he got to earth and saw all of the issues, he didn't just go, oh, well, I guess like God's not doing that. You know, well, the prophecies are written about me. I mean, he was perfect. Of course he wouldn't do that. But us as humans, you know, if we go with that theology of, well, God didn't do it, well, what if Jesus didn't do what he was supposed to do? Then you would have had the prophecies and nothing would have happened if he didn't live the life of obedience. But of course he was perfect and he walked that out perfectly for us. But there's just so much power in our choice and in us aiming at and constantly feeding on the promises and the word of God and looking to God like Jesus did, looking to Jesus for those action steps. I do what I see the Father doing. So it's so powerful for us. And it's, a, what was the word you used again, the C word? It's, it's conditional. So if we're not seeing breakthrough, I'm not saying that it's a matter of legalism, but I think we need to be based on these scriptures and so many others in the Bible. God, what do I need to be doing to partner with you to see this breakthrough, to see the kingdom of God transform earth in my character, in my life, in my circumstances? What do I need to do in order so that I can see your kingdom burst. Amen. 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 All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to pray a blessing, Lord, on this church family. We thank you, God, for the many and abundant promises that are ours in Christ. We thank you for, as Ephesians 1 says, that every single spiritual blessing in heaven is ours in Christ. Even better than the promise to Joshua where they looked out at the promised land and God says, I'm giving you everything in the land. Now we can take that even huger, higher, greater, and you say everything in heaven is ours in Christ. And Lord, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be speaking both quiet and loud, to help us see what promises you're putting before us, what new normals you're bringing to the table, and how you're inviting us to respond, to take that obedient step, that responsibility in relationship with you, that from our heart, our innermost being says, yes, Lord, 
I want this. Yes, Lord, I want more of you. Yes, Lord, I want to commune with you. Yes, Lord, I want those Selah moments that just continue to grow where you are the feast of my soul, where communion with you, I can say with the psalmist that it is the, the marrow and fatness of life, that you are the river of delights, and I feast on the abundance of your house. We pray, Holy Spirit, that this year, this, this week, this month, this, you would be growing us with that holy vision and the, the zeal-filled, fiery discipline to walk it out with you to your honor and glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.